Um, Madam Clerk, if you could please call the roll to ascertain the presence of a quorum. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Councillor Baker, Councillor Campbell. Here. Councillor Tiomo, Councillor Edwards. Here. Councillor Asabi George. Councillor Flaherty. Yeah. Councillor Flynn. Yeah. Councillor Garrison. Here. Councillor Janey. Present. Councillor <laughs> McCarthy. Councillor O'Malley. Present. Councillor Wu. Here. And Councillor Zakem. Madam President, we have a quorum. Um, thank you, Madam Clerk. I'm informed by the clerk that a quorum is present. At this time, I would like all guests, councillors, to please stand. Uh, Councillor Garrison will introduce our clergy for the day and ask folks to remain standing um, through the invocation or after the invocation. She will also lead us through the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Althea Garrison. I'm the newest member of the at Large Boston City Council. I'm going to introduce you to Pastor Roy Owens, uh, church name Waltham, Waltham Chapel, Church of God in Christ, location 234 Blue Hill Avenue, Roxbury, Mass, in the Grove Hall area section. Mr. Rollins. First, give it unto God, to his son, Christ Jesus. I come, Father God, offering a prayer of thanksgiving and for the good, perfect, and gift which you have given us in the presence of the city council. This day we pray for the mayor and the transportation department and the projects. We pray for the reappointment of Muhammad Ali Salam and the other who have worked so hard in dedication to the city. We pray for the new school projects for the safety of our children. We pray for the Community Preservation Act that the revenue, revenue for the community and the preservation, preserva preservation projects. We pray for the motion and the resolutions offered by Council Garrison for the homeless veterans and for the other city councilors, McCarthy, Flynn, Zakem, Edwards, and City Council Kim Janey, who have offered resolutions for today. We pray for the other councils, 13 city councils, and the 34 resolutions they have offered in order to show respect for the voters and for the community and for the citizens who have dedicated their life to the betterment of the Boston City Council and the city government. In closing, it is our prayer that the city council will see, and along with the mayor, that the work they do is not thou, not theirs, but the work of God, the creator of heaven and earth. So we pray this prayer. God bless the Boston City Council and God bless America. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Constitution saying, one nation, under God, individual, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, thank you, Councillor Garrison. Um, at this time, we will have two presentations, and um, I think we will actually start with Sam Tyler. Sam, are you, I saw you on the elevator. If you could make your way up here. Come on up. It's like a game show. Come on down. <laughs> As everyone know, uh, knows, Sam Tyler is the president of the Municipal Research Bureau, um, and it was recently announced that he was going to be retiring. Um, I don't think he's going on to something else. I don't know. Maybe he's going to do great things or go on the <laughs> beach. I don't know. 
but we wanted to take a moment to thank him for the work that he has done um, for the city of Boston, the greater Boston area for decades. Um, each counselor currently, and of course past counselors, have worked in partnership with Sam on many different issues. Um, he is passionate about the city of Boston, passionate about many issues, education, business community, and has been a voice um, and at the table for a really long time. So this was an opportunity for me as council president to thank him personally for the support he's given to me and my team in this role, but also to take this opportunity to thank all of, um, to thank you on behalf of all the counselors, including those who couldn't be at the meeting today. Um, I'm just going to read quickly the resolution um, that we put together, and then we'll take a picture. And I'm also going to give you an opportunity to say a few words. Oh, okay. um, but before I do that, um, Sam Tyler was named president of the Research Bureau in January 1983 and has been a member of the Research Bureau staff since 1972. Under his leadership, the Bureau has played an influ influential role in shaping the direction of public policy over a wide range of municipal and educational issues. He is the past president of the Governmental Research Association, a national organization of individuals professionally engaged in governmental research. Under his direction, the Bureau has received national recognition over the years for its effectiveness and quality of the research it does. Sam is a tireless advocate for the checks and balances in government, and as such was a key in establishing and pushing to establish a single ways and means committee for this council, as well as strengthening the central staff that we have and that serve us every single day. The city council has benefit benefited greatly from his tireless work and advocacy and his commitment to our great city. And we always, um, I think, have thanked you, but it will be a tremendous loss for the city of Boston. We hope you'll stay in touch with us, but thank you for the work that you've done for the city of Boston and all of us. Um, and most of this work is behind the scenes. We don't necessarily see it. So this is an opportunity to bring him forward, to give him a moment to, to share a few words, but also to thank him. So thank you, Sam, on behalf of the entire council. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I don't know, I, this is a surprise, so I wasn't expecting this and dressed accordingly. <laughs> uh, but I want to thank you. And, and, and uh, you know, it's for, I've worked for the Bureau for 46 years, and all through those years we were working with the City Council, and I think together we have accomplished uh, quite a bit over the years, although I must say that there was one time I got kicked out of the City Council. Um, but. <laughs> We'll forget about that now. Uh, but I, I think there's, there's laws, there's ordinances, there's, uh, you know, basically uh, special acts that have been approved with the council and the bureau working together. As I look at the city clerk, I have to remember the months and months and months of time we spent talking about whether we, the council would approve the merger of Boston City Hospital and University Hospital, uh, which turned out to be a huge success that hasn't been duplicated anywhere else in the country. Um, and it has, it's the fact that Boston Medical Center continues to, to maintain the public mission is what was intended. But through finance issues, education issues, Community Preservation Act, uh, you know, I think we've tried to be a resource and, and work with the council. Uh, we, every time that we, we talk to the council it's, or counselors, it's, you know, consider the Research Bureau a resource. And sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't, but uh, that still stands even when I'm gone. Uh, and Pam Coker, who is going to take my place tomorrow, uh, will be here and the staff is here as well. So the Bureau will, Bureau will still be involved with the city council, but it's been uh, a real pleasure on my part to to be part of Boston and making and involved in public policy that does make a difference for the city. And, you know, we don't usually get uh, cards or notes or calls congratulating us for our work. Sometimes from this building we get something a little different, but uh, uh, it, it has been gratifying to hear, receive notes and cards from, and emails from people. Uh, you know, acknowledging their appreciation for the work of the Research Bureau, and it really is a, meant to be an independent group that does provide factual analysis and data to help 
the public officials, and, and uh, it will continue to do that. So uh, I'm going to miss uh, the meetings, the hearings, and writing reports based on what goes on in this room. Uh, and uh, But it will carry on. So I uh, appreciate the recognition, uh, and we'll watch with interest. I'm not sure what the next act is, uh, but there will be one. So uh, stay tuned, and thanks. Someday. Someday. So you'll let us know. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be invited to party whenever that is. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. I'm going to acknowledge him right now. Thank you, Councilor Jim. Um, and as we bring up, we have one more presentation for a special group of students. And as they come up with James, the students, and um, I just want to quickly acknowledge that we are joined today by the president of the Springfield City Council, Justin Hurst, who is here. So just wanted to acknowledge him um, and the work that he does. Thank you for being here. Really appreciate it. And at this time, we're going to have a group of students come up who are from Japan, Nihon, Kyoto. <laughs> Mihango, <laughs> um, And so um, I'll just quickly say, um, this is the annual overseas sem uh, seminar that students from Kyoto at the uh, Horikawa High School um, participate in sort of every year. But this is a special year. How many years has it been? 60. 60. Six zero. Six, 60 years um, they've been doing this program. And so we wanted to acknowledge them. They're in the chamber. They were just going to sit off to the side. And we thought, that's just a why, why not come up here? So this is an opportunity for us to acknowledge them and the work they do. Thank you, James, um, for the work that you do and making sure this all happens. And then I'll have you say a couple of okay, great. great. Hi, my name is Midori Morikawa. I am the Director of Business Strategy for the Office of Economic Development. Thank you, Madam President and City Councilors. Um, so as Madam President said, it, uh, we, uh, this year marks the 60th, 60th anniversary between Boston and, uh, and Kyoto City, sister city relationship. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a Japanese resident. Uh, so 60 in Japan uh, is a significant number. It, uh, it says kanleki, uh, which means rebirth. Uh, so that means that we are uh, reaffirming our uh, friendship and sister city relationships. We just found out Councillor Asabi George uh, also went to Kyoto City during her high school year uh, as part of the sister city exchange as well. So we are very excited. Uh, these are chosen students from one of the high schools uh, in Kyoto City. Uh, so we will be showing them around and see, uh, show them how the city uh, council and city government uh, works with the city of Boston. In addition to that, uh, city of Boston is planning a series of events that this year, uh, March 26th, uh, Tuesday, we will be having a kickoff event uh, in the mezzanine of City Hall to uh, kick off the 60th anniversary celebration. On April, the last week of April, uh, Mayor of Kyoto, Kyo uh, Kyoto um, uh, Karokawa, uh, will be visiting uh, City of Boston as well for four days uh, to mark the 60th anniversary. So we're very delighted to have this, uh, these students, uh, and thank you so much. Um, thank you guys so much. Arigato gozaimasu. <laughs> um, I'm using a little bit of my Japanese, but at this point, if everyone can come up and take a quick picture. Yeah, when I was in college, yeah. You gotta work 
work on this paparazzi. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've lost a lot of it. We're going to catch <laughs> we'll up. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, and now uh, on to the regular order of business. So moving on to approval of the minutes. If there are no corrections to be made, the minutes of the last council meeting will stand approved. Seeing and hearing no objection, the minutes are so approved. Uh, moving on to communications from His Honor the Mayor. Docket number 0447, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend an amount of $200,000 in the form of a grant awarded by the MCAF Winthrop LLC pursuant to the 115 Winthrop Square Redevelopment Project Cooperation Agreement. The purpose of this grant is to fund a bus rapid transit plan as described in the project's transportation access plan agreement. Uh, docket 0447 will be assigned to the Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation. Docket number 0448, message and order for the confirmation of the reappointment of Muhammad Ali Salam as a member of the Boston Water and Sewer Commission for term ending January 7th, 2023. Docket 0448 will be assigned to the Committee on City, Neighborhood Services, and Veterans and Military Affairs. Moving on to reports of public officers and others. Madam Clerk, if we could read dockets 0449 through 0453. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Docket number 0449, notices received from the mayor of the reappointment of Brian Puccini as a member of the Living Wage Advisory Committee for a term expiring February 1st, 2022. Docket number 0450, notices received from the mayor of the appointment of Michael Parker as a member of the Community Preservation Committee for term expiring January 1st, 2022. Docket number 0451, notices received from the mayor of the reappointment of Catherine Bennett as a member of the Community Preservation Committee for term expiring January 1st, 2022. Docket number 0452, notice was received from the mayor of the reappointment of Alexander McLeod as a commissioner of the board, I'm sorry, McLeod, <laughs> as a commissioner of the board of examiners for a term expiring July 1st, 2020. Docket number 0453, notice was received from the mayor of the reappointment of Daniel DeRoma as commissioner of the board, or, board of examiners for a term expiring October 1st, 2020. Dockets 0449 through 0453 will be placed on file. Docket number 0454, notices received from the mayor of the appointment of Frank Baker as a trustee of the Neighborhood Jobs Trust for term expiring January 10th, 2020. Um, for docket zero, go ahead, Madam Clerk. You probably have a, um, a uh, sheet, page two, for substitution, um, when filed, uh, it said reappointment by the mayor and its appointment. So that is forthcoming, but we wanted to correct it in, in the agenda. Um, uh, thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, it, I'm, uh, I'm assuming there's no objections to substituting the language so that it's a, it's, it reads as the appointment of Frank Baker and not the reappointment of Councillor Frank Baker. Um, no objections, Madam Clerk. We'll obviously adjust the language. Thank you. Thank you. And docket number 0455, notice was received from the mayor of the reappointment of Trin T. Wynn as the trustee of the Neighborhood Jobs Trust for a term expiring January 10th, 2020. Uh, dockets 0454 and 0455 will be placed on file. Moving on to matters recently heard for possible action. Docket number 0196, order for a hearing to analyze the safety and security measures taken to protect school environments from threatening situations. 
Councillor Sabi George, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Due to uh, the snowstorm earlier this week and uh, the closing of school and the closing of City Hall, we are post we postponed that hearing. Thank you, Councillor Sabi George. So, docket uh, 0196 will remain in the Committee on Education. Docket number 0195, order for hearing regarding the South Boston Interim Planning Overlay District and neighborhood wide zoning. Council Wu, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Same issue, and the, the sponsors and community decided it'd be better to uh, reschedule this for a time when the community could make it and was not worried about parking and space savers and all that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, docket 0195 will remain in the Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation. Docket number 0182, order for hearing on admission to Boston's exam schools. Councilor Sabi George, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Yesterday, I chaired a hearing regarding the exam school admissions process. I commend Councilors Campbell and Janey uh, for their leadership on this issue. I'd also like to thank Councilors Flynn, Moo, Zakem, and Flaherty for being present. I will start off today's remarks on a similar note as how I started off yesterday's opening remarks. As much as I think it is important to talk about the structural in inequities in the exam school admissions process, I also want to be clear that these conversations involve a much broader issue. All of our schools should be a launching point for success. Focusing solely on our city's three exam schools takes away time and energy from solving the biggest disparity, which is that there is an unfounded promise of equal opportunity and access for all students in all of our schools, especially our high schools. Members of the Boston Public Schools Central Office spoke yesterday about the demographical disparities in the exam schools and initiatives they hope will remedy the start startling divide. I applaud BPS's effort to increase diversity in our exam schools and hope this remains a top, top priority going forward. Uh, Dr. Goodman and Ms. Rosinski, uh, or Dr. Goodman and Dr. Rosinski of Harvard's Kennedy School also served as panelists at yesterday's he hearing. Uh, they summarized their findings of the Rappaport Institute report, which was released earlier this year. The three main findings in their report include, one, less black and Latinx students take the ISEE exam, black and Latinx students score lower on the ISEE, and black and Latinx students are 13% less likely to rank BLS as their first choice. Based on the report's find, finding, doctors Goodman and Rosinski maintain that using the MCAS instead of the ISEE will increase diversity since the MCAS exam is on material that our students currently learn in our elementary schools. We had a final panel that consisted of three education activists and leaders in our community, Lauren Sampson from the Lawyers for Civil Rights, Edith Bazilli from Black Educators Alliance of Massachusetts, and Reverend Willie Broderick Bodrick from the Black Network for Black Student uh -huh. Achievement. They spoke of the importance of intersectionality on education reform, as well as the need for a more comprehensive and holistic way to determine eligibility for exam schools. I appreciate all of the testimony from our panelists. As we continue this important conversation on equity, we need to ensure that we are not excluding anyone from the conversation. When we talk about structural changes to school policies, we have to be cognizant about the impact it has across all of our district schools. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Sabi George. Uh, Councillor Janey, you have the floor. Hearing, uh, as well as the chair of the Education Committee. Um, just want to highlight the importance of equity here. This is an ongoing conversation. Absolutely right that we need to be looking at all of our high schools. Um, but this is an ongoing conversation that needs to continue. Uh, we need to make sure that all of our students uh, get access to a high quality education. So I look forward to having continued discussions with the advocates as well as my colleagues. Thank you again to our, our chair of education, Anissa. Uh Thank you, Councillor Janey, and thank you for the partnership. Thank Look you. forward to um, continuing to work with you on this important issue. Thank you. Um, so docket 0182 will remain in the Committee on Education. Docket number 0131, order for hearing regarding the use of public ways. Council Wu, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I'll defer to the lead sponsor for more detailed comments, but just wanted to thank representatives from the administration, um, 
Chief Chris Cook uh, from the uh, Environment Cabinet, uh, the Environment Open Space Energy Cabinet, um, Ken Brissett, Director of the Mayor's Office of Art, uh, Tourism, Sports, and Entertainment, as well as Ed Hesford from uh, Boston Transportation Department. They were joined by several community members who wanted to discuss the issue of more and more public events that require street closures and other um, neighborhood quality of life impacts as Boston becomes a place where people want to gather and um, raise money through walks and races and um, it was a great conversation to think through how the city is approaching that with their various different permitting conversations as well as the scheduling neighborhood by neighborhood and which locations might make the most sense. Um, Councilor mm -hmm. Zakum's office has compiled a lot of research district by district on the concentration of these events and when they run through the season which is mostly April through October. Um, and I think he has some next steps that we'll follow up on in terms of notice to residents and um, thinking about streamlining some of these. But I will defer to lead sponsor and thank, uh, also thank Councilor Flynn who was present at that hearing. Thank, thank you, you Councilor Wu. Councilor Zakem, you have the floor. Thank you, <coughs> Madam President. I want to thank uh, Councilor Wu for, for sharing this hearing um, and, uh, and getting to really the heart of the issue. Uh, you know, from the very beginning, this hearing order was filed to help myself um, and some of our neighbors uh, downtown get a better view of how these decisions are made, uh, when roads are closed for races, walks, parades, et cetera, how that's handled, which different city departments have a role. <clears throat> uh, Ken Brissett from the mayor's office, uh, Chris Cook, Eddie Hesford all um, had uh, great contributions to make, and I appreciate the willingness from the administration uh, to make some tweaks on how this is done. Uh, as Council Wu mentioned, there's a couple immediate action items, uh, starting with incorporating the Transportation Department's uh, alerts on upcoming road closures um, with ONS and their neighborhood by neighborhood um, email lists that go out. That's a good opportunity for people to have more notice. Also talking about creating a threshold for how large an event is before the special events folks at the special events committee are going to ask the organizers to go to the relevant civic association, whether that's the neighborhood association in Back Bay, a community alliance in Mission Hill, or any of the civic associations in our neighborhoods across the city, as well as bringing uh, the Boston Police Department uh, into this conversation on accommodating folks who live along these routes, on uh, using some common sense discretion mm. um, when it's safe to do so, even if a road is closed, let people exit or enter their homes. Oh, we've had a lot of success the past few years organizing this around the marathon, and that's come directly from the police department's planning uh, and staff to make sure that folks who live along areas that are closed for the marathon um, Certainly not perfect, uh, but there's been real improvement there, and I think we can extend that to the east. So I do want to thank uh, my colleagues for participating in the hearing, the administration for sharing this information with us, uh, my staff, uh, Jamie and Matt from my staff who put together, um, I don't know how many hundreds of pages uh, of documents uh, they reviewed to get this information ready for us uh, to, to, um, to digest. But it was really effective. Look forward to following up, and I think our folks in the neighborhoods were very pleased with the outcome. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Zakem. Uh, docket 0131 will remain in the Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation. Docket number 0377, message and order approving an appropriation of $34,926,700 from the fiscal year 2018 and fiscal year 2019 Community Preservation Fund revenues for community preservation projects at the recommendation of the City of Boston C Community Preservation Committee. Uh, thank you, Madam Clerk. Council Flaherty. Thank floor. you, Madam President. Uh, it's an exciting day for, for Boston. Uh, we held the hearing uh, last night. Uh, the purpose of the hearing was to consider the funding approvals for the second round of projects seeking public found funding from the Community Preservation Act. Uh, the committee recommends that the uh, funding of the 56 projects for a total of just a little more than $34 million uh, be approved. Uh, the recommended projects come from a wide range of neighborhoods, uh, specifically $18 million of which will go to affordable housing projects, uh, eight, uh, a little over $8 million to historic preservation projects, and um, eight point six million for recreational use and open uh, space projects, so um, totaling just a little over, uh, close to $35 million. We heard from uh, Emma Handy, the CFO of the city, from Christine Poff, Director of Community Preservation Program, who's with us today, uh, Aldo Guerin, Senior Planner, Parks and Rec, and Jessica Boatwright, who's the Deputy Director of the Department of Neighborhood Development's Housing Development Division. Um, through the committee discussion and participation of our colleagues, uh, we highlighted uh, several of the following. Uh, the transparent community process that included information sessions and engaged nonprofits and residents 
uh, across the city about the CPA application process, the process by which the funds are distributed. Uh, every neighborhood in the city now has received at least one project between the first two rounds of funding. The affordable housing component, which there will be 10 affordable housing projects, including two citywide projects. And additionally, there will be 170, 107 designated senior affordable housing units that will preserve affordability through deed restrictions, which was particularly exciting for a lot of folks. Uh, six parks and recs projects will also include a variety of improvements. And uh, lastly, uh, I'd like to make note that whether it's the affordable housing opportunities or the beautification of our parks, these projects presented to us today for the next round uh, will continue to benefit Boston for, for generations. And that's why uh, we supported the CPA. I know this body collectively went on record. That's why we had supported it uh, prior to that when uh, it came up a little short of the ballot box. But I think that the voters and the residents of Boston are now starting to see uh, all of this stuff come to fruition, uh, things that are in their immediate neighborhoods, but also good things and causes that uh, we're all supportive of. So at this time, I, I want to applaud uh, the time, energy, and effort that were put in uh, by the 56 applicants uh, who presented before the Council Committee last night on the Community Preservation Act, and also those that uh, participated but were not selected. Uh, our hope is that they'll continue to put their best foot forward in, uh, in the next round of funding maybe they'll be reconsidered so, uh, and, and look forward to the completion of their project. So uh, at this time, uh, take an opportunity to recognize, I know Christine Poff is here and mm -hmm. her team on behalf of the great work that she does on behalf of the Community Preservation Act. It's not an easy job for her to do. And as you saw last night, uh, we had, uh, it was like speed dating going through 56 <laughs> different projects. And I appreciate the uh, support of my colleagues to be able to kind of get through that uh, as quickly as we possibly could. So with respect to all of that, as chair of the committee, I recommend that docket zero 377, an appropriation order totaling $34,926,700 million from fiscal year 2018 and fiscal year 2019 community preservation fund revenues uh, ought to pass. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, thank you, Councilor Flaherty. Anyone else looking to speak on this matter? Um, at this time, um, and Christine, thank you and your team for um, making that process easy yesterday. Really appreciate it. Um, at this time, Councilor Flaherty, who is the chair of the committee on the Community Preservation Act seeks acceptance of the committee report and passage of docket 0377. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any, any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 0377 has been passed. <laughs> Madam Clerk, if you could please call the roll. Thank you, Madam President. <laughs> Councilor Baker. Councilor Campbell. Yes. Councilor Campbell, yes. Councilor Siomo. Councilor Edwards. Yes. Councilor Edwards, yes. Councilor Asabi George. Yes. Councilor Asabi George, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn. Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Garrison. Yes. Councilor Garrison, yes. Councilor Janey. Yes. Councilor Janey, yes. Councilor McCarthy. Councilor O'Malley. Yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. Councilor Wu. Yes. Councilor Wu, yes. And Councilor Zakem. Yes. Councilor Zakem, yes. Madam President, um, we have a unanimous vote of those present. Oh, thank you, Madam Clerk. Docket, thank you. Docket 0377 has been passed. Moving on to motions, orders, and resolutions. Docket number 0456, Councillor Garrison offered the following order for hearing regarding the state of homeless veterans in the city of Boston. Councillor Garrison, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I first would like to add Councilor Flynn as an original co-sponsor to this order and thank him for his support and also for his service to our country as a veteran himself. I offer this uh, Councilor order Garrison, for Councilor Garrison, what one moment. Um, any objections to adding Councilor Flynn as a co-sponsor? So what we'll do is substitute the language so that's reflected in the hearing order. Um, that Councilor Flynn is a co-sponsor to the hearing order with Councilor Garrison. Councilor Garrison, you have the floor. I offer this order for a hearing to discuss the state of veterans' homelessness in the city of Austin. As I said in my inaugural speech the day that I was sworn in to the, this council, working for homeless veterans is among my top priorities, and it is something that I care about deeply and compassionately. The United States Department of Veterans Affairs maintained that, that roughly 11% of the overall adult homeless population are veterans and 58,000 veterans are homeless on any given night, and twice as many experience homelessness at some point during the course of a year. Homeless veterans tend to be male, 91%, mm -hmm. 
single, 98%, live in the city, 76%, have a mental and physical disability, 54%, and are black, 39%. While there are many factors and influences, all homelessness in Boston, such as scarcity of real affordable housing, a minimum wage under $15 an hour, and not enough access to quality health care. A large number of displaced and vulnerable veterans live with the negative effect of post-traumatic stress disorder and substance abuse issues, which are exas exasperated by a lack of family and social support network. Many veterans suffer from physical and mental health conditions that make it difficult to find and maintain gainful employment, and thus pay for housing and military occupational specialties. And military training are not always transferable to the civilian workforce. Placing some veterans at a service disadvantage when looking for employment. Because of their service in the armed forces, Veterans are a high risk of experimental traumatic brain injury, PTSD, both of which have been found to be among the most substantial risk factors for homelessness. While the VA has been many years trying to address veteran homelessness problem, it remained to be seen. However, the program has been especially given the number of veterans living on the streets in Boston right now. The City of Boston has a responsibility to ensure that our veterans receive the care and benefit they have rightfully earned in keeping America safe, and to create a welcoming, safe home for them, too. For all these reasons, I ask that we hold a hearing to discuss the state of veterans' homelessness in Boston and how to better connect veterans to support services and care. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councillor Garrison. Councillor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. And I just want to say uh, thank you to Council Garrison for inviting me to be part of this. And thank you for your, um, your work on, on this issue for many, many years. Um, I also want to highlight the City of Boston and their ex excellent work in terms of helping our homeless veterans access housing. I think Boston is probably uh, the most compassionate city in the country in terms of helping our veterans get into housing programs, get into job training programs, get access to the VA medical s system. We have a great, a great program, and I'm also proud of the mayor and his team for, um, for really being a, a strong leader across the country and making sure that our, our veterans are treated fairly and treated with respect. And uh, looking forward to working with Council Garrison into learning more about how we can continue to work together as a city council, working closely with the mayor, and, and as a city to making sure that those veterans that, that need our assistance, our homeless veterans that might be suffering from substance abuse or, or lack, of jo lack of employment or training, uh, get the services that they need, deserve, and that they have earned. And we, all, we are also proud of the City of Boston Veterans Department under Commissioner Sterling for also doing excellent work um, on this issue and on so many issues. I know she, she is leaving the city um, at some point, but she has been an excellent commissioner. And I know um, veterans across the city are real proud of her leadership on so many, so many issues over the last several years. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. Anyone else looking to speak on this matter or add their name? Uh, Madam Clerk, if you could add Councillor Edwards, Councillor Sabi George, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Janey, Councillor O'Malley, Councillor Wu, Councillor Zakum, as well as the Chair. Docket 0456 will be assigned to the Committee on City, Neighborhood Services, and Veterans and Military Affairs. Uh, Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, just a point of order. Could this be jointly assigned to the Committee on Homelessness, Mental Health, and Recovery? Um, I prefer not to jointly assign it, so um, no, <laughs> respectfully. Um, we did join assignments before with respect to some hearing orders, um, but frankly, we're getting away from that just because it created some confusion. Um, so we're going to assign it to Councilor Flynn's committee, given the nature of it, and um, and go from there. So that I, I just, uh, through the chair, would ask to be included in scheduling this hearing because of my Absolutely. work and my focus on homelessness in the Absolutely. city of Boston. Thank I'd you. I greatly appreciate that. Thank you, Councilor Sabi George. Uh, moving on to. 
The next docket. Docket. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Thank you. Docket number 0457. Councils McCarthy and Flynn offer the following resolution in support of House Docket 884 and Senate Docket 1441, an act concerning genocide education. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Council Flynn, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Madam President. Um, Madam President, may I ask that um, Rule 12 be suspended if I could um, add Council Zakum? Any objection? Uh, Madam Clerk, if you could add Councillor Zakem as a third co-sponsor. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. Thank you. Um, Madam President, this, um, this is also sponsored by uh, Council McCarthy. Council McCarthy uh, sponsored a similar resolution back in 2015 to support the same bill requiring schools to teach the history of genocide, and the Council voted to pass that resolution. Uh, I just want to say thank you to Councilor McCarthy for his leadership on, on this issue um, and being a strong supporter of uh, civil rights and making sure that the voices of um, those that need to be heard in our society um, are heard. This is, a, this is currently a bill at the State House right now. It's sponsored by State Representative Jeff Roy, State Senator Michael Rodriguez, to require all school systems in Massachusetts to include a curriculum unit in teaching students about the history of genocide. We have to recognize that ethnic, religious, racial, or national hatred can result in extreme violence, and that can lead to terrible things like a genocide. We also want to teach our students to recognize the horror of genocide and that they should speak up when they see suffering and oppression of vulnerable people. If this bill passes, BPS would be required to teach their students about the history of genocide, including and not limited to the history of the Holocaust as well. Um, I do hope my colleagues will, su will support this this time again so that we can reaffirm our commitment to standing against hatred and that our students will know the horrible suffering that genocide caused in the past and not to be indifferent and suffering in the future, and to be a voice, as Boston has always been a voice, in making sure that the oppressed have, have a voice in government and that they are heard and that these lessons are taught so that, so that these terrible things, such as a genocide, do not happen again. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. Councillor Zakem, you have the floor. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Madam President. I want to thank uh, our good colleague, uh, Councillor Flynn, for including me in this as, as chair of the Civil Rights Committee uh, of this body. I think it's an incredibly important piece of legislation at the State House, um, and it's exciting to see that there is some movement on it on that level. Uh, it is so important that we don't forget the uh, lessons of the past, uh, lest we repeat them, and I think more and more we need to make sure that we are um, teaching our young people about history in this country uh, and across the world and, you know, in conjunction with uh, Councilor Garrison's uh, hearing order on general civics education. I think this very much falls into that and in making sure that people understand how we interact with our fellow citizens, with people across the world uh, is vitally important. So I want to thank Councilor Flynn for bringing this forward, Councilor McCarthy, uh, obviously as well and in the past on this. It's important legislation. Look forward to passing this and adding some support to the efforts of the State House. Thank you, Councillor Zakem. And just a point of clarification, Councillor Flynn, are you seeking suspension of the rules and, and adoption of this today? Yes, Madam President. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. Um, at this time, uh, Councillor Flynn um, seeks suspension of the rules and adoption of docket 0457. Um, actually, before I do that, anyone else looking to speak on this matter or add their name? Madam Clerk, can you add Councillor Edwards, Councillor Asabi George, Councillor uh, Flaherty, Councillor Garrison, Councillor Janey, Councillor O'Malley, Councillor Wu, as well as the Chair? Um, at this time, Councillor Flynn seeks suspension of the rules and adoption of docket 0457. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 0457 has been adopted. Docket number 0458, Councillor Zakem and Janey offer the following resolution. Supporting Massachusetts House Bill number 720, an act ensuring municipal participation of the widest eligible range. Councilor Zakem, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, I'd like to first uh, ask to suspend Rule 12 and add Councilor Wu uh, as an original co-sponsor. Any objection? Uh, Madam Clerk, if you could add Councilor Wu. 
Thank you, uh, Madam Thank President. You. Uh, this uh, is fairly self-explanatory uh, hearing order, or excuse me, resolution. Um, there's a bill up at the State House. Uh, Representatives Andy Vargas and Dylan Fernandez uh, have brought forward as a result of uh, well-organized advocacy from young people uh, across the Commonwealth, a lot of them who've been organizing around issues like gun control, um, civil rights, uh, important things for a long time, but have uh, really come to a head and that we've seen uh, such outstanding advocacy, um, thoughtful discussion about these issues. What this bill at the State House uh, would do is allow cities and towns to opt in to allowing 16-year-old people 16 and up to vote in their municipal elections. Um, I think this is important. We've talked about expanding access uh, to the ballot box in this body many, many times. When we talk about as we're getting into our budget season, um, one of the most vital roles uh, for this body uh, and for the mayor is approving, reviewing, and operating the Boston Public Schools. And right now, to have uh, some of the folks who are most active in there, who are most affected by it, not have a voice at the ballot box um, is, is not where we need to be. So this is an opportunity, as we often talk about, getting authorization or permission from the state to do something uh, in our home rule system uh, can be very burdensome. This is an opportunity for us to opt in. Um, so there would be a second discussion down the road whether the city of Boston should opt in if this bill passes at the State House. But I do think uh, it's very important that we support these efforts to give more of this, um, more of this opportunity and autonomy uh, to cities and towns across the Commonwealth. So I would ask that we, uh, we do suspend and adopt this resolution, making clear that this is a resolution in support of a bill at the State House that would then allow cities and towns to have their own discussions about this and having further legislation um, or not uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Zakem. Councilor Janey, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and many thanks to Councilor Zakem for his leadership as chair of the Civil Rights Committee. Um, this, the bill that he referenced is House Bill 720, known as the Empower Act, which would create a local option for 16-year-olds to vote in municipal elections. Um, we know how difficult it is when we cannot control what happens in our city, and, and any town or city should be able to decide for themselves. Um, we know that 16-year-olds are deemed old enough to drive, to work, to pay taxes. Um, older teens who regularly use public transportation, they're enrolled in our schools, and they're impacted by the decisions that we make here as a body. Um, in my work as a founding board member of Mass Vote, we successfully fought for pre-registration of 16 and 17 year olds, um, and that was a major step forward, but I think we can do more. Yesterday, as you may know, our former colleague, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, introduced an amendment, H.R. Uh, 1, that would allow for voting at 16 in federal elections, and that was reported favorably out of committee and will receive a, a vote on the floor of the House of Representatives. Um, and I believe that we should pass this resolution to move forward to support our young people. And just one final um, thought here um, is that our young people have always been at the forefront of any kind of movement. They are leaders of today, not of tomorrow, not of the future. <laughs> They're leaders right now, and we should remember that um, always and make sure that we're elevating their voice. Thank you very much, Thank Councilor you. Janey. Councilor Wu, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Just wanted to rise and thank my uh, co-sponsors for allowing me to partner on this and echo their comments that this dovetails with so much of the work that we've been doing to improve access, to empower our young people on all fronts, and um, this would be an easy step for the state to simply leave it open for municipalities. And I was going to end where Councilor Janey ended as well, that this is, this is important not just for young people, but for us mm -hmm. to be feeding and nourishing and um, supporting the people who will be taking care of us not too long from now, uh, making sure that they are getting ex the opportunity to help shape policy as soon as they are ready and as soon as um, we can benefit from their leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Wu. Councilor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I also um, rise to support this as well. Um, as Councilor Janey mentioned, uh, it's our young people that are providing exceptional leadership, not only in our city, but across our country. Just as an example, um, there was a city councilor here many years ago, Joe Moakley. Um, he, he joined the Navy at age 16 and served in World War II. Um, so a lot of young people are contributing every day to make this a better city and make this a, a better country. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad of, that the sponsors are um, taking the initiative on this. It's a, it's a very important issue. Thank you, Madam President. 
Thank you, Councillor Flynn. Would you like to add your name? Yes, um, Madam Clerk, if you could add Councillor Flynn, Councillor Edwards, Councillor Sabi George, Councillor Garrison, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor O'Malley, as well as the chair. At this time, Councillor Zakem seeks suspension of the rules and adoption of docket 0458. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 0458 has been adopted. Docket number 0459, Councillors Edwards and Janey offer the following order for hearing regarding biannual review of the Boston Employment Commission and Boston Resident Jobs Policy. Councillor Edwards, you have the floor. I'll be very brief. This is really just uh, following up on a refile. Mm -hmm. And essentially, uh, we had already passed and updated the Boston Jobs Policy to require biannual review. And so we are filing this now to get the April hearing and the October hearing uh, scheduled. Thank you, Councillor Edwards. Councillor Janey, Councilor Janey, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President, and many thanks to my colleague, uh, Councillor Edwards, for her partnership on this. This is a refile, but it's a very important issue that we have to monitor closely uh, in terms of what is happening um, and for these jobs in our community, um, ensuring that Boston <coughs> residents people of color and women are able to participate in this booming economy is so important, particularly if we're interested in closing the wealth gap here in Boston. Um, I know that this council, as well as the mayor and previous administrations have done a lot of important work in terms of strengthening the Boston residents' jobs policy, um, which calls for, the new ordinance calls for 51% residents, 40% people of color, and 12% women. Um, for the last 14 months, as I've been on this body, I have monitored uh, the jobs, construction jobs in my district, particularly those uh, in the Roxbury area, to make sure that our people from our community are getting these jobs. And, and we are falling short, or the construction industry is falling short. We need to make sure that we, um, that whether it is a union job or a non-union job, that our people from our community are able to participate in this booming economy. And I look forward to having a hearing as soon as possible on this issue. Thank you, Councilor Janey. You. Anyone looking to uh, add their name to this? Uh, Madam Clerk, if you could add Councilor Sabi George, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Flynn, Councilor Garrison, Councilor O'Malley, Councilor Wu, Councilor Zakem, as well as the Chair, Docket 0459 will be assigned to the Committee on Jobs, Wages, and Workforce Development. Docket number 0460, Councillor Edwards offer the following resolution, affirming the rights of journalists as workers and the need for a free press. Councillor Edwards, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Today, I rise in solidarity with workers. As we all know, democracy dies in the dark. A free press, a bold media, and unapologetic reporters are vital to shedding light all throughout the world and assuring that we have democracy. Today we live in a world where social media and citizen reporters often make the job of reporting look very easy. Let's be very clear. To be a reporter is to be skilled. It is to know the art of writing and moving news and moving individuals. It requires integrity and it requires courage. May I take this moment to Again, echo that I hope forever that Jamal Khashoggi rests in power. That is the kind of courage that reporters have. They have given their lives to make sure that they shed light in democracy. So in order for any other industry to exist with the skill set, the artfulness, the courage, and the integrity, for those industries to exist, those workers and those other industries require decent wages, benefits, and compensation. Journalists are no different. To the journalists here today, you spotlight, you highlight, and you hold accountable institutions, regimes, corporations, individuals, and governments, and government actors. So today, this government actor, this government body, is standing in solidarity with you for you to have the right to file grievances, have the right to job security, and to have the right to livable wages and benefits. Essentially, if we don't fight for journalists, I don't know how we can expect journalists to fight for us. We should not assume that having the power of the pen assumes that people have power. We should not assume that because journalists can get or have a megaphone that they aren't silenced at work, 
that they aren't isolated for sticking their necks out, that they don't need us to stand with them. We are stronger when we're held accountable. We are stronger when the light shines bright. We are stronger when journalists are compensated for their skill set, their intelligence, their integrity, and their courage. So I encourage the Boston Globe and WBUR to, as Spike Lee said, do the right thing <laughs> for democracy's sake. And until there is a fair contract, and until we know that you are treated with the dignity that your skill sets and your courage requires, you can be rest assured that the Boston City Council will be watching them. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for standing up for workers. Thank you so much for standing up for democracy. Thank you, Councillor Edwards. Council Malley, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Madam President. I rise to commend uh, the maker, my dear friend, the District Councilor from uh, East Boston, and ask that my name be added. I've been exceptionally proud of the efforts that this body has taken as it relates to stand with the working men and women of the city of Boston, be it the uh, national uh, grid workers or the hotel workers or the IBEW Local 2222, and I think we have made a difference, and nothing could be um, more uh, pressing in the national climate to make sure that the men and women who work for, uh, work for our press, for our independent free press, have the right to collectively bargain, have the right to work together, uh, and I'm proud to stand with them. Um, it is, not only is it not normal, this national zeitgeist of a president of the United States referring to the press as the enemy of the American people, uh, it is bordering on fascism. And we need to make sure that we have these incredibly dedicated men and women uh, whose job it is to write the truth, to uh, stand up for what is right, uh, and to continue to do that, to have the, the, the power to collectively bargain, to work together, uh, and to continue to do their job. So I'm proud of my dear colleague for her leadership on this. Ask that my name be added and look forward to seeing both folks who are in this room and others who couldn't be with us because they're out working uh, have the right to uh, unionize. Uh, we will be a better city, a better commonwealth, and indeed a better country for it. Thank you. Thank you, Council O'Malley. Um, anyone else looking to speak on this matter? Madam Clerk, if you could add Council O'Malley, Council uh, Sabi George, Council Flaherty, Council Flynn, Council Janey, Council Wu, Council Zakem, as well as the chair. Uh, docket, um, at this time, Councillor Edwards seeks suspension of the rules and adoption of Docket 0460. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 0460 has been adopted. Okay, and I am informed by the clerk that we have um, five late file matters. Um, three are, are from letters from our colleagues um, who are out, so you may not have those. Um, but two are our hearing orders. Does everyone have the, uh, the hearing orders in particular? Okay. Madam Clerk, if you could read the first late file matter into the record. Thank you, Madam President. From the office of Boston City Councilor Frank Baker, District 3, Dear President Campbell, please be advised that I will not be in attendance at the Boston City Council meeting on Wednesday, March 6, 2019. Please ask the City Clerk to read this matter into the public record. Thank you. Sincerely, Frank Baker, Boston City Council, District 3. The first late file matter will be placed on file. Madam Clerk, if you could read the second late file matter into the record. Thank you. From the Office of Councilor Max Yomo, District 9. Dear Madam Clerk, due to illness, I am unable to attend today's City Council meeting. Best regards, Max Yomo. The second late file matter will be placed on file. From the Office of Councillor Tim McCarthy, District 5. Dear Madam Clerk, President Campbell, and colleagues, please be advised that Council McCarthy will be absent from the City Council meeting on March 6, 2019. He is out of the country and will review the tape on his return. Sincerely, Timothy McCarthy. The third late file matter will be placed on file. The fourth late file, offered by City Councillor Anissa Sabi George. Order for hearing to analyze patron safety in nightlife settings. Whereas in light of recent tragedies, the safety of individuals, particularly women, in the city of Boston's bars, clubs, and other nightlife venues has been questioned. 
Whereas the current environment <coughs> demonstrates the need for the City of Boston to take more proactive role in maintaining public safety in nightlife settings for the residents and visitors, therefore be it ordered that the appropriate committee of the Boston City Council holds a hearing to examine the city's safety policy in and out of bars, clubs, and other nightlife venues in the City of Boston. Representatives from the Licensing Board, Boston Police, business owners, and other interested parties shall be invited to testify. Filed on March 6, 2019. Councilor Sabi George, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I file this hearing, I filed this hearing because the current environment demonstrates the need for the City of Boston <coughs> to take a more Bless proactive you. role in maintaining public safety and nightlight set settings for residents and visitors. Last week, our city experienced a tragedy with the murder of Yessi Correa. On Sunday, February 24th, a young mother exercised her right to go out at night and celebrate her birthday, but instead she was taken from us by a senseless act of violence. As we mourn the loss of Yessi, it is important to recognize that she is one of the many victims of violence. Violence. Just last month, another young woman, Olivia Ambrose, was kidnapped across the street from City Hall at Hennessy's Bar. The only difference is we were able to find her alive. Whether it's daytime or nighttime, all women have the right to socialize in public spaces without facing threats of violence, sexual assault, kidnapping, or murder. And yet, Yessie's death presents a sobering reality that the culture of these nightlife venues create an attractive environment for violence against women, and that is unacceptable. It is also important to acknowledge the rising rate of missing young men that further demonstrates the necessity of taking proactive and preventive measures to address the culture of violence that afflicts our city. I'd like to take this opportunity to applaud the hard work of the Boston Police Department, state and federal law enforcement, and the district attorney's office in carrying out this investigation especially for their transparency with the community to deliver justice for the family of Yessi Correa. However, I believe it falls on the city to address the cultural implications of this tragedy. It falls on us to address a culture of violence against women and most importantly to educate our community on how to hold ourselves, our men, and our nighttime venues accountable for assuring the safety and protection of all of our residents, but especially our women. Being in your 20s can be the most memorable and defining period of a person's life. We want our young people to go out with their friends and enjoy themselves. We need to do everything in our power to make sure that these are good memories and not ones filled with trauma. As a city council, we have the uni unique ability, if not the obligation, to create a forum for all stakeholders in our community, including the licensing board, Boston police, and business owners, to collaborate on solutions and come together to heal from the presence of violence in our city. I'd like to extend my deepest condolences to the family and daughter of Yessi Correa. As a mother, my heart breaks for their loss. I look forward to the hearing and working with my colleagues and all stakeholders on this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Asabi George. Councilor Janey, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Madam President, and thank you to mm -hmm. Councilor Asabi George for offering this hearing order uh, today. Um, I, too, would like to extend my deepest condolences to the family uh, the Correa family, um, and I just want to share um, the importance of, as we hold everyone accountable, the city of Boston, um, nightclubs, ourselves, the importance of really changing rape culture with men. Um, I'm thinking of just last night, so last night some of us, uh, I convened um, or hosted a little outing after work with some colleagues from across the Commonwealth, other electeds, and we went to a spot in my district, and we were leaving from downtown, so um, some of us jumped in a taxi. There were three women in the back seat and a gentleman in the front seat. And as I paid for the taxi, the two women had gotten out the car. The gentleman stayed in the front seat and waited for me to pay, which I certainly appreciated, and I said thank you to him for doing so. But I'm reflecting on that uh, if, in fact, he was the last one in, I wouldn't have to wait for him. Um, he, I wouldn't have to wait to make sure that he is safe, that he will be okay. Um, and we've got to do more. So obviously, as women, we want to do all that we can to protect ourselves and make sure that we're safe and that our children are safe, that our families are safe, and that's what we've 
always um, been doing, I believe, as women. And that certainly is important. But equally important, if not more important, is that we are addressing this culture of violence against women, this rape culture that suggests that it's okay to question a woman for her behavior, whether she wants to go out to a club, whether she wants to wear a short skirt, whether she wants to have a few drinks, whether she wants to walk home, whatever that she wants to do, she is free to do that uh, and should be free to do that in our city, in our society, and we've got to do better as a community, particularly with our men, with our young boys, helping them understand how to protect and respect women as equal partners in society. I also want to commend uh, the police department here and other officials in Delaware and, and particularly our district attorney for their leadership on this issue. So I look forward to having this conversation and figuring out ways that we can do a better job at changing uh, this culture against violence, uh, this uh, culture of violence against women uh, in our community. So thank you again Can for offering this. Oh yes, and please add my name. <laughs> thank you, Councillor Janey. Um, Councillor Flaherty, you're yes. the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Please add my name. I look forward to uh, an expedited hearing and, and would love an opportunity through the chair to uh, get um, a sense from the city, particularly our licensing and police division as to what they're doing with what this body passed several years ago, which was a Mets law. Uh, I know uh, Council Feeney was, uh, Clerk Feeney was the council at the time, but it was in response to what happened to Boston native Amet St. Guillen when she was down in New York. Um, and this really calls for uh, stricter protocols around our nightclub and restaurant establishments, training uh, door men and women, also known as bouncers, uh, who were in the best possible position to uh, sort of witness the inebriation. Uh, if someone's trying to get into an establishment or someone's being thrown out of an establishment, and if they can't walk and they can't talk, and particularly if they're uh, a woman and they're being uh, let out of an establishment, then I think that the, those are some of the trends. They also have to undergo pretty extensive background checks, too, uh, based on what we had heard and what we saw. There was a significant number of them had uh, fairly lengthy criminal records. It was clearly the case in what happened to a Met State again. So this body took action. Uh, we put together an ordinance uh, that passed that did require uh, stricter requirements on our establishments, particularly around training as well as uh, uh, background checks for uh, door personnel as well as other staff members. So not quite sure if that's sort of fallen off the radar screen, but it would be great through this hearing and through uh, the lead sponsor to ascertain that information and find out what's been going on with uh, the ordinance that this council passed called that we termed a Mets law uh, in recognition of what tragic circumstances that happened to her, but very similar in instances that have been happening around here. And obviously, uh, I think it speaks for everybody here that our thoughts and prayers go out to the Korea family for for their uh, tragic loss and, and, and such a, um, you know, uh, a cruel and, and, uh, and unjust situation there. So that said, I look forward to a hearing, and please add my name. Thank you, Madam President. Um, thank you, Councillor Flaherty, and I think Councillor Sabi George was shaking her head on all of that. Um, and uh, thank you, Councillor Sabi George, for bringing this forward. And when you mentioned Amet, who was a classmate of mine at Latin School, um, it's a conversation um, that we have and then we stop and we have. So thank you, Councillor Sabi George, for bringing this forward. Um, at this time, does anyone else want to speak on this matter, add their name? Um, Madam Clerk, if you could add Councillor Edwards, Councillor Flynn, Councillor Janey, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Garrison, Councillor O'Malley, Councillor Wu, Councillor Zakum, as well as the Chair. The fourth late file matter will be assigned to the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice. Fifth late fi file matter, offered by City Councillors Anissa Savi george Matt O'Malley, and Kim Janey. Order for a hearing regarding improving access to workspace and live workspaces for artists in the city of Boston. Whereas in 2018, a number of artists were displaced from affordable workspaces and from affordable live workspaces. Whereas we envisioned a creative Boston that demonstrates in concrete ways how it values artists by enabling them to create and showcase their work grow and develop throughout their careers and receive the support they need to flourish in Boston. And whereas the city is committed to being a cultural hub, we need to take a stand against the displacement of artists and improve their access to affordable workspace. Therefore, be it ordered that the appropriate committee of the Boston City Council holds a hearing to demonstrate 
to determine, I'm sorry, strategies for creating more affordable workspaces for artists. Interested parties should be invited to participate, such as the Office of Arts and Culture, the Boston Arts Commission, Boston Planning and Development Agency, artists who have experienced displacement or are interested in workspace and nonprofit arts and cultural partners. Councilor Sabi George, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I move for Rule 12 um, to add Councilor Janey, please. Any objections? Madam Clerk, if you could record that um, Councilor Janey is a third co-sponsor. Thank you, Councilor Sabi George. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, this is technically a refile, but we have added Councilor Janey as a co-sponsor. I'm thankful to Councilor O'Malley for his partnership in this work. As a small business owner of a craft store, this issue is very important to me. I know firsthand how important it is to have your own workspace, not just to create, but also to showcase. We are so fortunate to have so many artists who live, work, and create in Boston. However, there is a concern with workspace and live-in workspace, affordability and availability, especially with the troubling trend of displacement of Boston artists. While the arts in Boston are flourishing more than ever, artist communities and workspaces are being dismantled by increasing real estate development and policies that do not actually prioritize or protect our artists. The city provides a structure for artists live workspace to serve as a recognized community benefit for new development projects, but does not have a similar structure in place for artist workspace that can be rented at an affordable rate. As a city that is uh, committed to being a cultural hub, we need to take a stand against this displacement and work to improve artists, uh, artists access and ability to access affordable workspaces. I look forward to this hearing so we can discuss solutions that will prioritize an artist's ability to create. I'm fully committed to finding ways that we can remedy artist displacement and prioritize affordability. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Sabi George. Council Malley, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Madam President. I rise to thank my dear colleagues and friends for their partnership on this, the at-large council from Dorchester and the district council from Roxbury. Uh, there is a wonderful old quotation, and I've been stymied by trying to find out the, uh, the, the author of it, although I've been saying it for years, and it goes like this. Arts represent the exclamation point on history. And for a city that famously embraces art history, it's about time that we do more to support our artists' communities as well. Now, to be fair, I think that Mayor Walsh and his team deserve enormous credit for really doing more to both engage the artist community, for creating a new position, Chief of Arts, for working at the Boston Cultural Council to make sure that we have uh, better access to resources and grants. Um, but we are seeing a continued trend of the difficulty of finding affordable space, the inability to find any workspace of our artists. And this is a growing population. BPDA reported that in 2017, uh, 36,254 workers uh, consider themselves to be in Boston's creative economy. Uh, that number will expand by over 7% or about 2,000 individuals in the next decade ahead. Now, not too long ago, uh, in my neighborhood, we saw it in the neighbor that I represent, one of the neighbors I represent, Jamaica Plain, we saw Brookside Avenue, a community of artists in an old industrial building um, being displaced for high-end uh, luxury condos. Those are 30 artists who had to scurry elsewhere to find their work. Many of them did. Sadly, many of them are now outside of the city. So I look forward to working with the at-large council from Dorchester, the district council from Roxbury, to figuring out strategies that we can both tap into this building boom to make sure that we do have some resources available. We know it's not going to be easy. Uh, we know it's not going to, there's no, you know, magic bullet to uh, solve this problem. But it's a conversation where the council can lead and look forward to continuing to work with all of you to make it a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor O'Malley. Councilor Janey, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Madam President, and many thanks to Councilor Saibi George and Councilor uh, Matt O'Malley uh, for their partnership on this important hearing order. I'm very proud to come from a family of artists and creative professionals. In fact, my stepmother, um, Janea Majee Janey, God rest her soul, was an artist who uh, inspired me to tap into my own creativity as a young girl. And I'm very proud to represent a district where there is very strong, a very strong arts heritage with many wonderful artists. And I could list them, but I don't have enough time to do that here. Uh, protecting artists that have helped our city uh, is very important. Um, over the last year, in 2018, my first year on the council, there were several major incidents in terms of artists being displaced from their workspace, whether we're talking about the piano factory in my district or Northeastern's AMOP program, these losses 
um, were very <coughs> devastating uh, in our community, and we need to do much more to protect them. These uh, communities of artists are very important resource in Boston, and I'm a strong believer in the importance of the Boston's of arts academy, uh, economy. Uh, local arts economy provides tens of thousands of jobs, attracts tours, gives our neighborhoods their sense of cultural vibrance. Uh, with this hearing, we'll examine ways to help artists stay in their workspace. Um, we've seen with some development in, in the city of Boston that people have talked about uh, uh, affordable space for artists to live, but we also need to be thinking about their workspace. Um, as chair of the Committee on Arts, Culture, and Special Events, um, I look forward to having this hearing uh, in an expedited manner so that we can discuss this. I know there are many artists, certainly in my district, but throughout the city of Boston who are very anxious to have this conversation as well. So I look forward to convening this hearing um, and, and, and inviting all of you to participate in this important discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Janey. Anyone else looking to speak on this matter or add their name? Madam Clerk, if you could add Councillor Edwards, Councillor Garrison, um, Councillor Wu, Councillor Zakem, Councillor Flynn, Councillor Flaherty, as well as the Chair. The fifth late file matter will be placed in the, assigned to the Committee on Arts, Culture, and Special Events. Uh, moving on to the green sheets. Anybody wishing to remove a matter from the green sheets may do so now. Moving right along, I am informed by the clerk that there is one late file matter which in the absence of objection will be added to the consent agenda. Hearing and seeing no objection, the matter is so added. The chair moves at this time, um, moves to adopt the consent agenda at this time. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it, the consent agenda has been adopted. Um, and just, um, just one um, friendly reminder, just with the late files, if we could just be a little bit mindful about late files, only because we want to make sure they're on the actual agenda. Um, so, so that the public can know what's on the agenda. Thank you. Memorials, we're going to adjourn. I'd like everyone to please rise at this time, colleagues, staff, as well as guests, as we adjourn today's meeting in memory of the following individuals. Do you have an announcement? Oh, just a moment, I apologize. Everyone sit back down. Councilor Edwards, I apologize. <laughs> You can and you were standing. looking at me, I'm thinking. I'm like, I, so I just want to make sure, so our, uh, the, the reporters who are here in red shirts in sol solidarity have brought by a bunch of sh shirts for all the counselors. So just before we run out of here, maybe we can have the shirts held up and have a picture in solidarity. I know that they couldn't stick around. They were, I believe, on their lunch break and had to get back to work. <laughs> Thank you, Councilor Edwards. Anyone else have an announcement? Okay. At this time, I'd like all guests, counselors, and staff to please rise as we adjourn today's meeting in memory of the following individuals. For Councilor Sabi George, Rob Rastuccia, Salvatore Tausioni. For Councilor Flaherty, Judith Caputo. For the Chair, Raymond Daniel Ivasca, Kendrick Price. And for all counselors, Jassy Correa. A moment of silence, please. Thank you. Um, the chair moves that when the council adjourns today, it does so in memory of those aforementioned individuals. We are scheduled to meet again in this chamber um, at Boston City Hall on Wednesday, March 13th at noon. All those in favor of adjournment say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it, the council is adjourned. Aye.